Hey, it's Matthew David Hurtado, God's Ambassador of Free Will. So today is a special day for you. I'm releasing something that I truly believe will open your mind to unlimited prosperity. Now take a look below and you will see a link. If you click on that link that you see below, you can opt in and you will get three audio versions of my new book, Trust, the Most Powerful Force in the Universe, that is set to release on January 5th, 2021. I will give you three additional chapters for free over the next coming few weeks in your email box. If you're watching this after the fact, then you can opt in below and you will get the audio versions that have already been produced immediately. And these chapters that I selected for you, they can transform your life. I know not everybody can even afford to get the book because they don't understand the value of wisdom yet. Now, for those who do, I strongly suggest you buy the physical copy of the book. And by doing so, you can have it in your library because there is a plethora of life-changing information. The same information that took me from bedridden and bankrupt back in 2009 to training like a pro athlete today in full, perfect, complete well-being and also manifesting a seven-figure online income just a few years later when I discovered this information from nowhere because of the grace of God, not because of me. So I'm going to share with you now Chapter 1, it is titled, Tithing, the Highest Level of Knowledge and Wisdom and Understanding. I would be kidding you if I did not let you know up front this chapter will be all about the money. After all, the dying fiat U.S. dollar, which will soon be a digital dollar, says in God we trust. Some people are probably upset that a spiritual book took things to such a level. The talk of money can rub people wrong. Usually, the people who have little money feel very uneasy when I talk about the principle of tithing. It is so easy on the outside to see why they have little money. The very fact that giving some of it away scares them implies the feeling place within their heart. The law of compensation rewards you or punishes you based on which jurisdiction you put yourself in, the sweat of the brow bondage slave, the riotous prodigal son, or the repentant prodigal son. When you reflect fear in your material substance, you are not the son of God. It is a curse, and thereby living under that curse puts you in a condition of carrying this world's burdens hoisted on your shoulder. Point blank, I will tell you right here in black and white that tithing is the foundation of our entire teachings and my success. God's grace is sufficient for every human need, and the attitude of gratitude is riches. Feeling gratitude as you give to the source of your spiritual nourishment puts your heart in the correct alignment for reflection of good or God's blessings, to flow into your human experience. In this chapter, because I have done so many talks on tithing, first fruits, alms, and seed faith, I should share several of my letters to allow ministries partners who have sown into God's work. A prosperity cycle is when you know in your heart this truth that God revealed to me in late 2019. When man thinks he is giving... He is receiving. I repeat, when man thinks he is giving, he is receiving. In the 3 to one prosperity formula that sets as the premier capstone discovery at Allow Ministries website, the three keys discussed are the operating system of the mindset I used to move out of poverty and into a wealthy and permanent prosperity attitude. You get what belongs to you according to the law of compensation. As you apply tithing, non-judgment, and following the fastest path to your joy in every moment, 
into expression and reflection of your attitude, prosperity emerges. You see, prosperity is and lack is not. Scarcity is a dream of the five material senses. And this illusion holds you captive as long as you reflect fear of loss and self-responsibility for your human needs. God never engineered you to live in a massive oppression system and slave mentality whereby you consent to fear of anything missing in your life. Do you see the nonsense of this? You are implying that life has a shortage of good at some point of material existence, and it just so happens to be where you stand. In actuality, your inner fear, based on graven pictures of outer kingdom torment, lies, that you allowed into your inner kingdom imagination, has caused blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy is a spiritual crime, and it is not unpunishable, for what it represents is a form of character assassination of God, the only presence, power, and mind. Satan is the inventor of such wickedness and opinions of evil that call good's creation, God's creation, evil, while at the same moment exalting wickedness as a reasonable assumption. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about for clarity. A man who believes he has but $20 in his wallet. His five senses report seeing a bill for $750 that he feels in his hand, smells the coffee in his kitchen, tastes the sugar in his morning latte, hears the kids arguing, and touches the paper in his hand. Look at how his five senses are deceiving him at every turn. Waking up in the morning, he believes in his current idea of working for money as the only path available to him. He reasons that it suits the level of education he has, the type of job available in his town, and offers this set amount while consuming up to one-third of his life. Because he has recorded a history that is not his story, as in God's idea of ever-present supply and riches according to grace, the man is a riotous prodigal son who leans on his own understanding. He is drunk in his five senses, and when he wakes this particular morning, awake is a service for the dead, by the way. So when he awakes this particular morning, he dies again in ignorance of the Father, the only suffering that exists. What this man can comprehend about life with his five senses are seeing the 750 that is due and a mere $20 in his wallet, tasting the morning latte, smelling the coffee in the kitchen, hearing the kids argue at breakfast, touching the paper, which confirms the bill exists. Because he is a creature of ignorance and lives drunk in his material senses, focused on the outer kingdom of trickery as his reality, he could not be further from the truth. Suddenly, let us say this man reached enough personal pain in his circumstances where he recognizes he is not getting anywhere with all his hard work. Searching online, he stumbles upon one of my videos. He is fascinated by the story of how I overcame being bedridden and bankrupt to manifest a seven-figure online business in a few short years. I agree to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with this man so he can cease being a burden on others, borrowing money, complaining about his circumstances, and teaching his children by example how to fear life and live stressed out all the time. You see, while he thinks he is a loving father and all-around great guy, his seed is a curse to those around him. I would read or listen to that last statement again, just to be clear you understand it. His seed is a curse to those around him. What you teach is what you live. Living adulterated in ignorance of the Father and the Father's grace, where riches flow to man by divine decree, 
is the polar opposite of how this overall great guy is planting his seed everywhere he goes. So I begin to explain to this man that money is not his problem. His arrogance is the problem. Upset by what he hears, the man cannot comprehend what I mean by arrogance and replies to me, I work my butt off for my family and do so much for others that I cannot see your point. I ask the man a simple question. Who made you responsible for all these other people? The man now thinks I'm out of my mind, replying, They are my family, and when my friends need assistance, I always help where I can. This man sees himself as a valuable contributor to those around him while he scratches the bottom of the barrel for sustenance to meet his own needs. He suffers from martyr syndrome based on a meme that says a grinder is virtuous and makes one a saint. There is also a strong chance that he believes the ultra-rich are greedy a-holes and therefore he scares away money. So I ask him another question. While you were considering your standard of living, did it ever occur to you that other possibilities are easier, more exciting, and far more profitable? Yes, Matthew, that is what I am asking you how to do. I urge this man to learn my 3 to one prosperity formula and report back to me with questions. After all, if he cannot follow simple instructions and invest the time to learn new things, I just saved myself a ton of breath. A few days go by and the man comes back to me with questions. I acknowledge his willingness to change as a sign of relief because most people choose to stay arrogant and set in their ways. Now I explain to the man what I mean by arrogance. When a person puts a high degree of self-importance on their actions or contribution being of immense value to others, they cripple the weak even further. Matthew, are you suggesting that my children are weak and they do not need me to provide for them? What about my sick aunt who is lying in bed all day and needs me to get her groceries? I respond, these are great reasons as to why you might assume responsibility for the needy. And while it is beneficial to serve others, you are only giving them a pittance of what you are capable of offering. How so? The man responds. If you knew that man is weak in his flesh and strong in his spirit, and you humbled your opinion of how brave you believe your efforts to be, turning everything over to God, you would not see these people as needy. You would see the divine in everyone and everything, and this correct observation alone would reward them more than your best efforts. The man suddenly catches a glimpse of what he is doing. He responds, You are suggesting that because I see them as needing my help, it is disempowering to them? I agree by nodding my head and replying, To make matters worse, your inner vibration of fear is the seed you are planting in each moment. Your worry and concern over their well-being are, in fact, the act causing a disturbance in mind and minds mingle. Whoa, the man replies as he is taken back. He says, I never saw it that way. I was only doing what I felt was respectable and right. After pausing to let this man integrate what he just learned, as wisdom is now reaching him to correct the error in his reasoning, I let the revelation sink deeper. Now I respond by saying, when you correct the way you look at the world and give of that seed which belongs to God, being of one accord with goodness, beholding only God in your thought, every action you take will produce a miracle harvest. Taking action from fear, doubt, discordant thoughts, and evil imaginations only spreads more of the same. You see, your arrogance was in a false sense of importance believing in your estimation of life. You curse those who receive from you when you lay your service on them in the capacity of observing them as less than divinity. The man now understands what arrogance implies and why his former behavior was producing lack, limitation, and disease in his world. 
I explained to this man how it is not our works that prosper us and those around us. Instead, the grace of God is sufficient for every human need and is always ever-present, ready, and willing to pour upon anyone willing to receive. We only receive that which we align with by reflecting a divine quality being expressed through us as an attitude towards life. The man says to me, So you are suggesting that because I saw these people as insufficient within themselves, because of a material condition such as age, weakness in their flesh, and I feared or worried they needed me, this ca- this behavior cursed them? Yes. I now believe this man was capturing a glimpse of God's man and not the wicked mortal that creeps the earth, as described in Romans chapter 8. The man says to me, I find it hard to believe in tithing because it seems like a trick to get my money. Why should I give God money? Doesn't it seem like I should be getting the money? I replied to this man with a new perspective, stating, All the money you can hold in your possession, according to your knowledge, results in all the resources you have. It requires your best ideas, your plans, your network of friends, skills, time, and energy. Money is mentioned 140 times in the King James Version of the Bible. If you add the words gold, silver, wealth, riches, inheritance, debt, poverty, and related topics as they pertain to money, no other topic is mentioned as often as money. I lean in to whisper in a lower tone, Why do you think the only place in the Bible where it says, Prove me now in the entire gospel refers to tithing. The man responds, It sure seems like the church is out to get more money, and I don't see so much good to sacrifice what little I have when they don't need it as much as I do. Who says you're supposed to give your money to the church, I reply, adding, It seems as if the church is not your spiritual source of nourishment, if it does not inspire your faith to sow a seed in honor for the exchange of divine favor, correct? I then open the King James Version of the Bible in Malachi chapter 3, beginning with verse 10 to read the following out loud. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. After telling this man my story of learning this principle of tithing at a time when I was destitute and struggling to become very prosperous in a short time, I explained the following. It is the reason why you are tithing, that either lifts your consciousness to a higher plane of wisdom or mocks God. It is not that God needs money. It is the acknowledgement of His Word, proclaiming He already knew this and established a system for you to trust Him and prosper. I then explained to this man, one of my earliest mentors taught me that only arrogant Christians would not tithe. I add by saying, Do you remember what I described arrogance as? Please clarify again so I can be certain, the man replies. It comes down to an idea of being self-sufficient, and the emphasis is on the importance of our works as opposed to what God has already given us by His grace alone, I say with utter conviction. The man recalls our previous conversation and correlates the ideas in his memory as I lean even closer. I continue by saying, Your idea that $20 exists in your wallet and you have a debt of $750 happens to be the extent of your best knowledge. Whose ideas would you rather trust? The one producing lack or the one saying, Prove me now, proclaiming the windows of heaven will open? Ha! The man bursts out, 
Well, shit, if that's the case, everyone would be tithing and getting rich, but we both know they're not. I pull back a bit and smile. I reply, how's that attitude working out for you? I pause and stare at him, adding, some people have all the answers and none of the success. Some profess to have none of the answers and all of the success. In the middle, some have some of the answers and just enough success to pretend they have all the answers. What amazes me is the less I pretend to know of God's mysteries, and yet I settle it in my reflection of absolute trust that He is always right, the more I prosper. I conclude by saying, I gather you are observing people who appear to be tithing and are yet still leaning on ambition, pride, false responsibility, and human creativity to prosper themselves. After he appears to let that thought penetrate through the fog in his human perception, I add by saying, Tithing is a form of worship to acknowledge that we of the flesh can contain nothing have nothing of value, and are nothing outside of grace alone. When you tithe with a cheerful heart by knowing these ideas are the truth of life, you cannot fail to prosper. It is not a lottery to become a pompous carcass in the world of material fashion form. It is to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Hold up. What did you just say, the man asks, seemingly curious now. I reply, I thought that might spark your fascination. Mortals are not qualified to receive the divine blessing, as they still live in the flesh's curse. The tithe is a ritual that sacrifices the meat, material substance, of this world that the human mind portrays as essential to satisfy every human need. When you bring that substance into the Father's house, you are tying into the aeon of the inner kingdom, spiritual substance, whereby you produce expectation from within, clothing you in the summer aeon with an increase where real life exists. Not only that, I further my impartation of wisdom by saying, tithing is the only spiritual practice that breaks the spine of lack by silencing the satanic attack of fear on your life. Now let me give you one finishing thought. I chime in before he opens his mouth, saying to him, When you truly get what I mean when I say that the law of compensation rewards you by what you are reflecting as the quality of your seed action, a major breakthrough happens. The fact that tithing is the only secret in the entire Bible that breaks fear of your finances is the very reason Satan attacks it in the world and confuses people to turn against it. Finally, the man gets to open his mouth and again he says, So Matthew, you are asserting that if I tithe to God in the way you describe and pay my 10% as a tribute, I'll be able to cease living in fear, and that will cause the law of compensation to reward me? I put my hand on his shoulder and look him in the eye, saying, My friend, every stronghold and demonic force set against our life from the outer kingdom aeons, the rulers, the archons, that have kept you bound for eons knows one thing. Tithing is the only supernatural promise you got authorized by the word of God to give you provision, protection, and divine promotion in their world. Without it, principalities of darkness in high places have complete legal rights to hold you in bondage via sorcery. The man replies, Your words just gave me goosebumps. I'm not sure what to think of all that, but something in me just felt a power surge and I feel in my soul that what you are saying has merit. At last we end our conversation, and I explain to him the truth of the gospel in one short paragraph. Your life is not in flesh and blood. Satan's creation and rule over humanity exist in that domain. Melchizedek is the living Christ. 
tithing is your doorway out of sorcery because of what God said and promised, not because you earned it, because you're willing to receive grace. Here are a few letters to Allow Ministries partners that I think you'll find beneficial to further and deepen your understanding. Titled, How to Receive More. Dear Seed Faith Partner, There are times that I feel frustrated with myself, and it seems as if the needle isn't moving. All my efforts, desires, hopes, and dreams seem stuck in the mud. Today I'm reminded of the story of the little boy whose father asked for the penny in his hand, which the little boy held on to profusely, refusing to let it go. The father had a harvest on his mind, a dollar bill. While the little boy clung to his penny, the father wanted to put a hundred times that value into his son's hand, but he couldn't. The little one refused to open his hand to the source of his wealth. Giving with a heart of pure love and trust is always the first step to break apart the stony pots of lack and limitation so water can be poured in and turned into fine wine, the best experiences of life. When things have stagnated, slowed down, or lack seems to be on the event horizon for fear of economic depression or loss of income, this is the time to do the fearless and mighty bold act. In 2017, I faced such a circumstance. It was around March, and my product business was stagnating. I had tried voraciously to apply all my human understanding and make sales grow. Nothing was working. I was getting stressed and frustrated, even fearful that perhaps I had lost my mojo. I decided right then and there to apply a secret that worked for me several years back. It happened when I was operating a failing nutrition franchise store, looking at the prospect of losing it all very soon. What I did was bold and faith-filled. I ponied up more giving to begin offering up as faith seeds, sowing in the winter season as described in the Gnostic Gospels, to influence my outcome. Years ago, my mentor, Dr. Mike Murdoch, taught me that my only influence over my future was my seed. That advice came in incredibly handy in 2010 when the nutrition store I was running was in trouble. I decided to take the small profit from each day. It was only around 10 to $15, and I couldn't live on it anyhow, and sow that seed to God. I planted it with absolute faith into the specific ministry where I received my inspiration to trust God. I prayed over my seed the following way. I release this money freely, and God returns it to me exceedingly, 100 times over, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Fast forward. A divine miracle happened. An idea came that produced an instant six-figure income within 24 hours of deploying this idea online. This miracle happened at just the last minute, as everything seemed to be going awry. Out of nowhere, this idea transformed failure into mega success. Turning to God as my source repetitively each day and planting faith seeds washed away the dream of lack from my five senses that appeared to me in that store. Moving forward to 2017, as my product business was stagnant, stuck, depressing to my five senses, I began to double my tithe. That's correct. I started sewing up a double portion and tithing on the income I wanted to receive. A weird series of events transpired, leading to a long-lost friend contacting me and urging me to buy Bitcoin. I hadn't thought of this, and I wasn't even aware that this was a real and viable money-making idea. Something out of left field emerged that was not related to my product business at all. I was like that little boy who suddenly opened his hand instead of clutching that penny. This idea came from my friend after doubling my tithe and wrapping my faith around each offering. I knew in my heart that trusting in God couldn't fail, so there I was, with my hand open. And that clutched penny was my idea that my income came from my business or from my customers. God wanted to show me that my source of supply was Him alone. 
It didn't matter that the amount tithed meant far less for me in rational terms, because I didn't want my mind to determine my supply either. My mind was also not my supply. God alone was my all-sufficiency, and His divine mind was always providing me with rich ideas. Before, when I began outlining where my substance pours in from, looking to people, my business, my customers, or even my mind, this created a blind spot. Also, clinging to set ideas out of fear is an attitude of grasping that disallows God to show us where His opportunity for us lies, waiting for us to claim it. Look, money doesn't dry up. It always flows. God always knows where the money flows, and He will lead us in front of it to capture it if we trust Him. Seed faith sowing is the surest practice to receive a divine harvest that will let you know that you didn't do it. He did. So what happened when I sized up my faith and doubled down? I felt the spark within to take a Bitcoin position when it was around 3,000 and participated in many moonshot opportunities that 2017 presented. At the best time when all the action began taking place, I found myself in the right place, right time, precisely on schedule for a miracle. Had I decided to keep counting on my mind, my business, my customers, my skills, and not involve my faith, I would have missed the greatest opportunity. Most people want to instruct God on how our business or job should promote us or outline how we should receive our supply. The most significant decision is when you allow God to reveal what He sees that you are missing. Usually, it's far more like that man trying to give his son a dollar in exchange for a tightly held grip on a penny. Do you see the difference? There's your answer. P.S. I released a new meditation audio titled, I Am a Billionaire Spiritual Master. It is the compilation of truth that 2020 has revealed to me. One single idea planted in your unconscious mind can open the most excellent harvest of your life. I made this to bless you, and you can rest assured I'll be listening to it as well, every night for 30 days before bed, to allow the ideas to sink deeply into the treasury of my deeper mind. The next letter is titled, Rest in Peace. Dear Seed Faith Partner, If you are not standing in agreement with God, or if you are standing in agreement with God, nothing out there should concern you, nothing at all. You see, when you are in a covenant with someone who is not capable of lying, never fails to deliver on his promises, and can't be disrupted by anyone or anything outside of himself, things start to look pretty good for you. The key is, if you don't claim your spiritual authority and instead argue for your limitation and fears, you can suffer the penalties for breaking the trust agreement or peace in your heart. Holding a state of perpetual peace in your heart implies the following. A. You are not concerned or worried. B. You are at rest regarding who, what, where, when, why, or how things will be accomplished. And C. You are relaxing the natural human resistance to receiving. R.I.P. Rest in peace. Be dead to the world and alive in Christ. The most advanced technique is ironically the simplest of them all. Meditating on scripture or affirmations that bring about a change in how you perceive reality is the key. First of all, I want to acknowledge your tithes and offerings to our ministry as blessed seeds. We pray over every donation. We are also very responsible concerning God's substance and are sensitive to where He wants His money to go to work. I know in my heart that when man thinks he is giving, he is receiving. Tithing and planting faith seeds is the bedrock for our entire prosperity ministry. It's not about greed and excess, and you can rest assured it is about freedom inherent within spiritual reflection of good, to be, do, and have your heart's desires while expressing joy in the Lord. 
God quickly showered our family with blessings when we went all in on believing on him back in 2009. By 2013, we had built multiple companies out of thin air that generated millions of dollars in sales, proving God's reach is not obstructed by our external conditions. During that experience, however, I made a critical mistake. I was becoming resentful of paying my tithes. They were getting quite large, as if it was a chore, a burden, or some old-timey religious dogma. My heart was becoming haughty. I began believing in the New Age philosophies, which subtly etched out God and replaced it with belief in self. Big mistake. The catch is, while God is within you, the self, human reasoning, material man, is an empty carcass who is cursed by Satan in Egyptian bondage. The good times soon came to an abrupt end as my faith in God alone became slanted toward an arrogant ideology of might within my persona. And when I began patting myself on the back and taking credit for all the wealth, that fallout began. God perpetually scans our hearts to see who is strong in faith and whoever lacks confidence in him, he corrects. I was emptied of those possessions and had to relearn the idea that my heart and trust must be all for God, for his blessings to continue to shower me according to what I teach, the law of least effort. Yes, you can doggedly hustle and grind, use force, manipulation, coercion, bribery, and tricks to gain material possessions. This path is not God's way. It is a corrupt man's way, the arrogant way of this world. Fortunately, I learned, and God once again poured out incredible blessings, and I found myself in a state of moment-to-moment -moment flow and joy. One of the best lessons I can give you is to speak only about what you desire. God called himself the Word. All God did was speak. Selah. The next letter is titled, A Five-Step Formula That Works Every Time. Dear Seed Faith Partner, let me remind you that it is not you, not your neighbor, not your job, or even your business that determines your prosperity. It is God's grace. Watch and see how easy a harvest is to claim for good from once you realize the source. Turn only to the source and put all your trust in His goodness. Today, meditate on the following simple prayer. I am the infinite source of supply that never fails, remains eternally intact, and constantly pours forth loving plenty to fulfill all my human needs. I lean only on God. I put all my trust in God and keep peaceful non-judgment of what's going on out there. It's all His kingdom. God is the only power. God is the only presence. God is the only mind. Praise you, God. It is our human judgment, which leads to resentment, blocking our flow of good, that disrupts the eternal demonstration of God's blessings upon our life. The world is at war with the truth, and we know Jesus Nazarene Christ, your living imagination, already overcame the world. Step number one, turn away from the perception of any problem. Instead, declare that God's law of eternal good is the only power at work in your life and your circumstances. Step two, rest in peace. Lay down your life to gain your life. Walk not by human sight. Instead, you can trust your life to God regardless of appearances. Your peace is a contract that connects you to the covenant performance and provision, protection, and promotion. Step number three, pour forth your imagination over the perceived problem out there and release the power of the living Christ. Use the technique called the ABC break process. It's all built into this single formula. Step number four, speak only of what you desire to experience. Release your words upon the situation and declare it as settled. Step number five, 
Refuse to waver or change your mind. Be unreasonably expectant for God's eternal goodness to show up. It will. It is a divine law. These five steps above will open the Red Sea and carry you to your promised land of rich milk and honey. These are spiritual laws that I've demonstrated to work in any situation. Recall, your so-called situation at hand is merely a test. Will you rely on wisdom or human reason? The rest is up to you. Be rich in His presence. The next letter is titled, How to Attend God's Supper Feast. Dear Seed Faith Partner, If you get invited to be at a feast, would you show up empty-handed in the presence of the King? Do you mean to tell me that you wouldn't bring your best treasure to share? After all, you are honoring the King. Or would you dishonor the invite to partake in the King's Supper? You would consume His delights and stare Him in the eye, knowing you held back that which proved your heart as loyal? Would you believe He didn't see through the arrogance? After all, He is a king. You're not. He is doing something hidden and kept private that He only reveals to those He chooses to know His secrets. His spies are always recording our motives. He is searching for someone to believe they are worthy of His spoils. It is not by vain mortal reasoning. Instead, our heart towards obtaining His wisdom, the messenger who invites us to the Great Supper. You may have been born of this world a peasant, a bond slave. A peasant lives for a season as a martyr to his king, and the land chalked full with peasants is all around you. The king knows all that the peasant has. It is his job to look after his kingdom. All the king needs, which he longs for in his heart, is someone to trust. A faithful servant who loves the king and is willing to sacrifice his life for the king. When this peasant gets discovered, he invites this peasant into the kingdom to serve the king. He gets to partake of the spoils of the king. Now imagine, if this was someone whom the king called his son or descendant. He adopted you when Jesus gave his life for your sins, providing an eternal covenant to lay claim to as a son of the king. But the king can't be deceived or mocked. He knows all. Would you still show up to his supper feast and act like a spoiled, entitled peasant who declares, I deserve to have everything because I demand it? Would a king invite this type of guest to a wedding feast? Most of your brothers tried this form of a petition to get invited, and the king turned his sights away. Most peasants are too busy to show up at the wedding feast as they take pride in their folly. However, the king is full of compassion and he corrects those he loves. So loss becomes his cure for their lack of gratitude. The king noticed his people were uneducated in a code of honor where he could favor them in his palace. So he sent them to a school, like a boarding school with the hopes that the peasants would turn back to him. After much loss, some peasants remember how good the king is, and once again, he invited the reformed to his great supper banquet. The supper is where he likes to tell his story. All history is his story. If you hear his story, then you are one whom he knows, and your seat is ready for you to return to his wedding feast once again. Instead of demanding your portion, showing up empty-handed with nothing to offer the king for his favor on your life, you have sown honor. Gathering up your earthly treasures, you pay tribute to the king for all he has done for you. He gave all the peasants in the kingdom the free will to drink strong wine and leave at dark, to wander off into strange lands. He sent his messenger off to pursue those who got lost in the wilderness. The king loved all his people. Fortunately, you see, he let others pursue this drunken wandering, knowing he already owned all the hills and valleys. No outside army could dare touch the king's people, for his will for them was to serve his kingdom and partake in the riches therein. 
When the peasants ran off into darkness in a drunken stupor, they were often terrified. The sights, sounds, cold temperatures, and dense fog prevented them from seeing. The king instructed the messenger he sent to rescue the lost to never infringe on their choice to remain lost. Instead, the king gave his word to his messenger Malachi and sealed it with his promise. In Malachi 3.10, we hear from the messenger to let the king of kings prove himself. It is the only part of the Bible where he makes such a promise. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room to receive it. Jesus, your elder brother, he was sent off into the wilderness. Amongst all the drunken who had left the kingdom, he told them all these terrors they experienced in the dense fog were nothing. The king ruled over all the hills and valleys the human eye could perceive. Being drunk, the peasants hated the king and wanted to put Jesus to death. They were deficient and empty-headed people whose hearts were not ready to serve the kingdom. Yet the king still ordered their instruction, and he staged the death of Jesus whereby the drunk could no longer see the man. However, they were still drunk and in a dense fog, for Jesus Christ remained the king's right-hand man, whom the sober loved and adored. Jesus simply left the dense fog and returned to the kingdom again, for his instruction echoed eternally in the voices of the drunk who understood not Jesus' words. Jesus satisfied the king's request to spread his message across the wilderness, for once a lost peasant became sober, they could comprehend Jesus' message and come home again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The cost of discipleship is to leave the wilderness of the outer kingdom and the drunkenness of the five material senses. Turning within to the I am presence, the kingdom is at hand in the present moment now. Jesus never left the kingdom and neither did you. When you sober and realize that the king loves you so much to ensure you receive his message this day, you will at last come to know and love the king. His will for you becomes manifest, and the spoils of his kingdom are rightfully yours. For you are no longer a peasant, but an equal son, descendant of Jesus Christ. Will you sacrifice the drunkenness and give 10% in honor to God, trusting in his messenger Malachi? For God to prove himself as the king who reigns supreme over all the hills and valleys the human eye can see? Will you turn within to the great I am presence and sit with the king at the great supper? He has summoned you to his feast in honor of your return home. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me, turn within to the mighty I Am Presence, and be one with Christ, the living imagination of spirit. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, lost in the wilderness, where the dense fog of the material five senses get deceived by the outer kingdom aeon drunkenness. And I will give you rest. Sit with the king at the great supper in the living imagination and reflect his fruits of the Spirit. Put to rest human will and allow the king's spoils to fill your belly or human needs. Sow a moment of respect to the king of kings. You are, after all, a house guest. Hebrews 12, verse 7 and 8. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all ye are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. The tithe is a tribute in recognition of being called to the great supper and receiving the spoils of the king's feast. The king sent Malachi to be a guide out of the dense fog of human ignorance or the wilderness of the material five senses. 
Your tithe is the proof of your acknowledgement that the spoils of the feast all belong to the king. Your appreciation and honor guarantee the king's favor at his table, for you are no longer a peasant but a son. You have reached sobriety and overcome the temptation for strong drink. What you hold in your material hand was never your supply. The king supplies from his bounty and withholds not good for whom it is due. When I tithe, it is not because I am calculating from human reason and trying to move God into satisfying my material needs. My appreciation is for the fact that God has given me a direct hotline to his kingdom within and guarantees he will rebuke the satanic attack, drunkenness in the material senses. I tithe to receive more of what he has already given me by recognition of being a son, a priest in the order of Melchizedek, unequal with Jesus Christ. Wow. You can't fool the king. He scans the hearts of men and continually searches for someone to trust him. He calls you to the great supper and asks you to join him. When man thinks he is giving, he is receiving. P.S. Your tithes are guaranteed to open the windows of heaven as God promised. He is not a man. He is not a liar. Turn within to the great I am presence and declare in your heart, I am this perfect day. The life that lives in me is the light that cannot fail. I am surrounded by lavish, rich substance, and this substance now manifests itself as a large, steady, dependable, and ever-increasing supply of money. The ancient mystics used to understand the concept of substance, the inner kingdom aeon of summer, or unfailing and ceaseless invisible supply. And they meditated on this idea daily to become atoned with lavish riches. Use the affirmation that I just gave you for five minutes each day as you tithe and watch your world transform by the power of His grace and the riches in heaven. The next letter is titled, You Must Feel Free to Prosper. Dear Seed Faith Partner, let's talk about money. The energy of money is simple, freedom. If you feel free inside, you will be comfortable around loads of cash. If you feel fear or condemnation within self-punishment or other unworthy ideas, you won't do well with stacking satoshis or piling up gold reserves. The satanic attack of the dream in the five material senses will divest you of the spoils you have gathered. Remember, your job as a son is to represent God in the world. This reflection means you express His fruits of the Spirit, as opposed to the lusts of the flesh. Goodness, peace, love, joy, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance, long-suffering, these are all void of fear. Therefore, all that remains is the inherent freedom for good, or God, to be expressed. All day long, our human sense perceives fear. The bills we perceive we can't pay, the debts lingering over our heads, the fear of tomorrow, and these terrors in the night are but dreams. Isn't it great to know that we have a God who has made it easy to leave Egyptian sorcery and escape from all these worries? That's correct. Rest in peace. R.I.P. Mark 8, verse 35. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. I tell you now in black and white that tying into the consciousness of rich, lavish substance as my supply by tithing and reflecting the freedom of God's responsibility to provide, protect, and promote me opens the heavens for the blessing to pour out. None of my best laid plans worked for me prior to standing in the covenant with God's grace as my all-sufficiency in all things. Therein lies the beauty of surrender, 
that enables you to feel the sense of freedom from within your heart. Once you recognize that God does the heavy lifting, you can take a breath, relax, allow. Once you feel free now, you'll see that He has been waiting for you to open your mind. Your human sense of what you think ought to be done under the circumstances is fear expressing itself as worry or concern. Instead, express trust as an attitude towards life and allow God to prove himself by stating the following. I am absolutely not concerned because I know wonderful things are happening. God is all in all and always goodness. Only good can come to me. Only good can go for me. There is no other power. When you tithe, you have scriptural authority to lay down your concern and align with God's kingdom by expressing freedom. God said he would rebuke the devourer and open the windows of heaven. So trust him and get rewarded under the law of compensation. Selah. P.S. Thank you for your tithes to allow ministries. Your generous giving allows us to spread the gospel and do God's work. The seeds you sow never leave your hand. They enter your future where they multiply. You cannot outgive God. The last letter is titled Footsteps to the Kingdom. Dear Seed Faith Partner, I want to send you some love and appreciation for being our ministry partner. Your seeds are a massive blessing to us that allow ministries. I know that these seeds also bless you by reaping divine expectation, which creates a supernatural force to draw in spiritual all-sufficiency in the summer aeon, the living imagination of spirit. I want to share some insights I have titled Footsteps to the Kingdom. Number one, don't think of above and below. Number two, instead, think inner and outer. Number three, the Lord called destruction the outer darkness. Number four, the world out there is that darkness. Number five, the kingdom is your living imagination. Number six, you reflect God, His image, in His idea of imagining you in a spiritual life, never material. Number seven, it is God's imagination, fruits of the Spirit, that He is knowing. You are to reflect His mind and what He knows to be true about you. Number eight, therefore, the heavy lifting is His work, not yours. Number nine, if He knows all sufficiency in all things as harmony expressed by divine love, there isn't an ounce of lack anywhere in His creation. Number 10. God always meets every human need with divine love. His presence fills all space and is divine love. Number 11. Entirely separate from the dream of the five senses of material living is the life divine. Reflecting His fruits of the Spirit opens this realm, whereas fear, confusion, lack of confidence, double-mindedness, and division casts you into sleep in the material sense of ignorance of the Father. Number 12. Only suffering, the only suffering, is ignorance of the Father, drunkenness. Number 13. Your life is a permanent and fixed idea in God's mind. Matter and illusions of disharmony cannot obstruct what God knows or is expressing himself to be in himself as you. Number 14. When you cease identifying with material existence and deny the falsehood claims of matter and temporal life, you destroy the ignorance of the Father and return to the kingdom of heaven. Number 15. You were sent to a school, the material realm of ignorance, to learn to trust God so you will know Him and love Him. Number 16. The world didn't crucify Jesus. Jesus Christ, imagination, 
crucified the false world of the five material senses. Number 17. In other words, Jesus, the man of flesh, dying to the four elements of matter, Lucifer's counterfeit reality of God's light, revealed life in spirit and the resurrecting power of laying down the falsehood, counterfeit claim of material life for the life divine in spirit. Number 18. As a spiritual fact, this life eternal never settles itself in a condition called matter or the human five senses temporal illusion. Number 19. Rise out of the sleep of mortality and the idea that you were born of an earthly mother and father. Number 20. Repent. Turn within to your living imagination, the Christ. Number 21. Call forth the mighty I Am Presence within, the living God. Number 22. Destroy every idea of material existence out of thought. Number 23. The world out there, as perceived by the five material senses, is known as winter. It is a barren place, a dead carcass. Number 24. You sow in winter to reap in summer. Number 25. Summer is the inner kingdom aeon of imagination, spirit. Number 26. Life is divine and can't be temporal or alive in the outer kingdom aeon where the rulers or archons deceive with trickery and sorcery. Number 27. The middle kingdom is the middle place, human reasoning, where the rulers bind the bond slaves in Egyptian sorcery. Number 28. Man's fall is the 666, or engaging the middle place to distance oneself from the mighty I am presence within and living imagination, who, what, where, when, why, and how. Six degrees of separation through the inner, middle, and outer kingdoms. Number 29. Rest is receiving. Number 30. Trust is the highest form of faith and the putting to rest of fear, worry, doubt, and to engage human reason, reason on a 666 quest or question. Number 31. God's full blessing is already yours and has poured out already. Number 32. Return to the Father as the prodigal son coming home. And number 33, receive his divine love and be set free at last. With immense gratitude for you, this concludes chapter 5. Selah.